Welcome. Thank you for coming in this evening after I'm sure what's a very, what has been a very, very long day. Um, we are going to plunge right in because we're running late and uh, people have some very short time. So we are not going to have a whole lot of introduction because, well, we have the president of Columbia here and you all know who he is. And we have Kailash Satyarthi, who is the founder of the Kailash Satyarthi Children's Foundation in India. And he's worked with uh, Malala Yousafi. So um, we're going to get started right away. This is a panel about envisioning and building peace. And I'm going to start with President Santos. 50 years of civil war. How do you get people to even envision what a peace might look like? It's, it's difficult because people get accustomed to all types of situations, uh, even war. And uh, they start seeing war as a, something normal. And then when you uh, reach a peace agreement that like we did after 50 years, um, people then say don't, they don't believe that that could be true. And then they are skeptic that this will not work. So you need a, a lot of persuasion and a lot of teaching uh, to reconcile the society. Uh, I have learned uh, many things in this process. Uh, I learned uh, very uh, clearly that uh, leading in times of war is much, much easier than leading in times of peace. In times of war, you and I, I was Minister of Defense. I, I made war as Minister of Defense against the people with which I made peace afterwards. The leadership in times of war is a very vertical type of leadership. You have the bad guys on the other side, you have the good guys here, you rally the forces, and you go. That type of leadership is quite simple and easy so far as you're su successful. Instead, to make peace, you need to change attitudes, you need to change perceptions, uh, you need to teach people how to forgive. And sometimes that is very difficult. When you have to sit down with somebody whose daughter or mother or father has been killed or tortured and say, listen, I'm going to sit down with the person who did this and I'm going to be more lenient in terms of applying justice. That is very difficult. And in the case of Colombia, for so long that we lived through so many years, the society, in a way, uh, was losing uh, something which is very important to have in any society, compassion. Uh, how, to, how to understand the suffering of other people. We, after so many years of war, were losing our compassion. So now to build this in society, to reconcile, it's a long-term process. Uh, I compare that to the building of a cathedral. To build a good cathedral, you have to have solid bases and then build it brick by brick. This will take a long time. People want change immediately. And then you have to explain, no, this is a slow process for it to be a successful process. So you have to persevere. We reached the peace agreement through perseverance, through goodwill, through not, and this is important, not letting yourself be guided by public opinion. Sometimes you go, have to go against the, the mood of public opinion. Um, it's difficult. Uh, when you have many people against you, uh, you think, am I doing something wrong? But if you are convinced that what you're doing is correct, you have to follow through and persevere. Well, I'd like to turn to Mr. Mr. Satyarthi about the idea of compassion. So you work with children. 
who I think probably have a different vision of the world than adults do. How do you see compassion and uh, playing into peace building? Uh, well, uh, as many of us agree that peace does not mean the absence of war or violence. Peace has many faces and many ma manifestations. For me, I see peace on the face of a smiling child who is careless, who can cry, who can laugh, who can jump, who can play. This is peace for me. And if such children from different communities, from different religions, from different ethnical groups, hug each other as children because there is no divide in them. They are much more united inherently. That is the manifestation of peace, the true manifestation. Uh, I share with him that compassion is the key. In whole my life, what I say, that I am trying to globalize compassion. The globalization of market, economy, knowledge, technology, products, we have all seen. We have also witnessed the consequences, good or bad, both. Global warming and terrorism and all kinds of things, tensions, inequality. But this is the time to think and act differently. And that is the globalization of compassion. Because compassion is not just empathy. It is a feeling where you connect with others' suffering and you uh, you uh, drive, uh, there is a drive to change the suffering of other person and that will make the world a safer and peaceful place. So I have been working with children in whole my life, um, freeing them from slavery, helping them in education, uh, not only in India but I work across uh, 140 countries including in his country, uh, and I love uh, the children uh, in Colombia, and I have been to remotest places, uh, even when you were not the president. And last time when we met, I also met a number of children, former child slaves and so on. So I, I, I could feel that they are changing everywhere. Because children do not want war. And in the human history, there is no example where children were responsible for any war, any poverty, any kind of divide, divide of cultures and religions. Children are not responsible. We have created religions and cultures. We have created walls and boundaries. We have created all the wars and poverty. So why children should suffer? That should be the starting point. Children are just victims and sufferers of what they have not responsible for. They are just victims. So let us connect with our children through compassion and try to ignite compassion. I, I tell that compassion is something, a God-given wealth. It's a divine wealth inside each one of us. But what we do, this wealth we use only for ourselves, for our own biological children, siblings, friends. But this wealth could be invested in the world and we can make a world which is really safer, which is really peaceful by learning from children. What we have done in all our lives, we keep on teaching our children. You are Hindu, you are Muslims, you are Christians, you are Cambodians, you are Colombians, you are Pakistani, you are Indians, so on and so forth. The children don't understand this. We teach them. Sometimes I say that this is the time to learn from children, learn from children. So learn from them. Can I compliment on that? Sure, I, absolutely. I, I agree, I agree 100%. <laughs> uh, through children, when you, you were saying children are born without prejudice uh, and they don't want any walls, if we can teach the children that we are one people, which is called the world, and we are one race, which is called humanity. And that uh, no matter what religion or what color of your skin or what uh, your thoughts, we are one. That would help tremendously yeah. to world peace. Yeah. 
And so I, I, we, we did not uh, agree to get or, 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 or got together before this meeting, but we... Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but at least there are so many things common. Compassion is common, but both of us share Nobel Peace Prize. So. <laughs> Well, it's good to know that in a peace building session, I won't have to break up any fights. So I do want to delve a little bit more deeply into the idea of reconciliation, because I think that that's the tough part. You know, you can sign a peace treaty, but then you have to get people who have had years and years of war and conflict and have developed hatreds to unlearn hatred. So I'll start with you, President Santos. Have you had the occasion to actually try and reconcile two people on opposite sides? Yes, and uh, let me tell you an anecdote which is a bit before that. When, when I started the peace process, some very uh, illustrious uh, persons, a professor from Harvard came to my office and said, this is gonna be a very difficult journey, very difficult journey, you need energy, uh, because you're going to feel some time that you're going to throw in the towel and simply don't continue. And he said, talk to the victims. Share with them their experience. That will give you the energy to continue. And I did that through five years. Every time, and, many, and I felt that many times, I was so disillusioned public opinion against it and why, what is happening, should I continue or not, then I spoke to the victims. And the victims, I thought, were going to be the most uh, radically opposed to transitional justice, to give a, some kind of uh, leniency to the perpetrators. And I came into the process with that prejudice. And they taught me I was completely wrong. The victims were the first ones to say, continue. We don't want other people to suffer what we suffered. And they were the ones who said, uh, I want to meet the people who did this. And so during the peace process, we brought together the perpetrators and the victims. And uh, that was a great experience and see how reconciliation can be possible. Uh, of course, we had examples of, of every nature, some that, some that screamed, some that said, I don't want to see you ever, you killed my daughter. You do. But overall, when you start uh, explaining to them that this is the only way that you you can leave a country in peace for the next generations, people start to understand. And in the transitional justice, in every peace process, uh, where you draw the line between peace and justice is the key issue. Always you will find people against what you decide from one extreme and the other extreme. But once you take the decision, you have to start implementing the procedures to promote reconciliation. One thing that is extremely important, the truth, to know what happened. Many victims didn't want even reparations, monetary reparations, no. They just simply wanted to know why. Why did they do this? Or where is my son? Or where is my daughter? Simply by telling them that giving them that information, they change completely the, their propensity to reconcile. So there are different ways that you can approach reconciliation, but that word is the magic word for uh, a, a peace process or peace to be uh, really constructed on solid basis. So there have been um, so many uh, cases where people have tried to work with children in reconciliation. I, I think uh, about Northern Ireland, for example. Um, where do you think children can play a role in the reconciliation process? And do you have any examples of where you think it, it's worked very well? Well, in India, for example, where we work with children, 
there are certain pockets which are insurgency prone pockets uh, where some of the ultra uh, maoist uh, pick up the guns and sometimes they are using children to use those guns young people uh, and uh, using them for violence and uh, we started working there with the communities with the children and found that one of the reasons was that uh, the children were not given a better alternative, better choice, an environment where they can feel confident and friend, friendly and hope. And more important, they should have trust in their future or trust with the establishment. So we started working in those pockets. So some of these children were working as child slaves or child laborers, but others were uh, being used by uh, these uh, violent groups. So when we started working, there was some opposition from those violent groups. But then we tried to tell them that, look, you are demanding equality, you are demanding justice, and that's why you are picking up the gun. But justice and equality can never come without an education, quality education. So if we are preparing children through education and more secular education where they can learn love, they can learn compassion, and uh, we tried to bring children and youth from different communities and different religions, and they started working together. And from both sides, some of the, uh, the perpetrators, predators, or violent groups, as well as the children of ordinary people who were victims. And we have seen tremendous change over the years, where the people started feeling that, no, this is not good to give guns in the hands of tiny children. After all, they are our younger brothers and sisters. So in those places, we have seen a massive decline in the use of child slaves or child laborers, but also use of children uh, for uh, combatant activities. But here I would also like to underline, uh, when we talk of the broader piece, um, then just compare that world needs $40 billion in additional money to ensure education for all children in the world annually primary and secondary education both. This, is, this money is not a big thing because it is just less than the global military expenditure. If the world decides that we are not going to invest in arms and ammunition and all kind of fight and violence, perhaps we can protect all generations, the entire generation from all kind of miseries and difficulties and we can ensure education for them. Just less than a week Global military expenditure can solve the problem of children in the world and we can save the generation. But here in Europe, who is the biggest uh, arm trader? Who is the biggest manufacturer of arms? Arms are manufacturers in, manufactured in this country and they, they are used for violence eventually. When you, create, when you produce a gun, for what? We are not able to give toys in the hands of our children. We are not able to give books and pencils to our children. And we are producing more bullets than books. We have in a number of countries, right from South Sudan to Eritrea and many places, where the number of soldiers is bigger than the number of teachers. So what kind of world we are going to create? For peace, we have to reverse this. We have to reverse this. Children should be our priority now to make a sustainable human society and a peaceful world. So we have a number of conflicts going on in the world right now. Uh, North and South Korea, there's all kinds of escalation going on uh, in the Middle East. What sort of advice, and this is a question for both of you, you can take turns, no fighting. Um, Do you think that we did any fight? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what kind of advice would you give uh, people who, who want to get started, who want to start to de-escalate a conflict? Well, each conflict has its own particular conditions, and uh, to generalize conflicts is a mistake. Each conflict has peculiarities. But there are some common denominators. First, try. Many people, in our case, thought that it was impossible, that 
uh, to make peace in Colombia with the FARC was impossible. But you can then say that the impossible is possible. And, and so the first, uh, the first uh, ingredient, the first uh, step is try. Then uh, I think that no conflict is impossible to resolve if there is goodwill from both parts. The, the big challenge is to uh, create the conditions that the goodwill is present in both, both parts at the same time. Many times, and we, you can see that through history, there's will from one part and no will from the other, and then things change, the other one want and the other, the other one does not. But so you have to, in a way, create the conditions. For example, in, in the case of Colombia, we, we studied very, very closely all the peace processes that had been negotiated before. And we tried to extract what was applicable to our conflict. And uh, we said we need some basic conditions in, in our case. First, uh, there was a, a necessity for the guerrilla to see the war as uh, something that will never uh, achieve its objectives. For that, we need to change the correlation, military correlation of forces, which we did. Second, the leaders of the, of the, of the FARC, the leaders of the guerrilla, personally had to change their, their way of, of approaching the conflict, that it would be for them a good business uh, in terms of they will win out of a negotiation. And third, in our case, very important, in today's world, the, uh, what, what the military call the asymmetrical wars need the support of the region. So we went and uh, made peace with the rest of the region and the case of Colombia, for example, with Venezuela, with Ecuador, where we didn't have very good relations and brought them in. We brought in the military that are usually are perceived as enemies of, of peace because during times of war they have a bigger budget and they have their own interest. We brought in the military. So you have to start defining the conditions that would uh, make uh, a process uh, successful. And this needs uh, to be uh, done in a very, I would say, uh, rigorous manner. But there is no conflict that could not be solved if there's goodwill from both parts. Okay. Do you have any? Yeah, I fully agree with him. <laughs> and as a president and politician, he can have this, this political vision. Uh, in my case, being a social activist, I think that the social solutions to these problems should also be found. Peoples to peoples connect, more communication. Uh, we have to create an ecosystem where uh, people can meet each other. Like we, we tried in India and between India and Pakistan, but not just under the banner of peace. Otherwise, it could have become a, become a political issue and sensitive diplomatic issue. So we said that both countries need education for their children. We are investing so much on arms, we must invest, invest on education. People liked it. The parents liked it. Oh, yes, we, wa we want to, to invest on education. Why are we investing on this? So what should be the priority? So we tried to organize a series of events, like the youth and children's uh, uh, movement between these two countries. And we have seen the results. These young people, when they met each other, they said, oh, the Pakistani children come to India and feel that, oh, we are at home. And so was the case of Indian children went to Pakistan. This, they are so loved by people and ca taken care by the people and the parents of other children. They had that lifelong impression. If you are able to 
build up that. It will definitely help people's to people's contact and learning, understanding each other, respecting each other's culture and language and issues instead of going into other details. Perhaps it cannot be done uh, so easily with uh, the, 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 the mm, most intelligent people, but so-called innocent children can make it happen. And uh, it's possible. Uh, some of the groups are doing uh, good work between uh, Palestine and Israel also, and they have been much more successful uh, in building the bridges uh, through the young people. So that is very much possible. Um, so I, 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 I'm very optimistic, and I'm hopeful that uh, the future world would be led by youth. We, we should not consider young people as problem but we must consider them as solutions. They are solutions. They are changes. The changes inside them. Young people are enthusiastic and energetic, but they do have a strong element of idealism. And that idealism has to be recognized and channelized uh, to make this world a better, safer, peaceful place. And that's why I have recently launched a campaign called 100 million for 100 million. 100 million young people are victims of violence. That includes slavery, trafficking, refugee crisis, and so on. But on the other hand, hundreds of millions of young people in university, colleges, schools who are in well-off situations, they wanted to do something good for the humanity, for the society. Their hearts are more open and vibrant for others. So we are trying to give them a platform so that these well-off children in schools, universities, can become the spokespersons, change makers, and leaders for those 100 million left out young people in the world. And this way, on one hand, we are trying to practically globalize compassion, but also we are trying to create a new culture of global citizenship among young people. And we have to, uh, and I very much count on the power of youth. It sounds but, to me very much that you're describing sort of a grassroots peace movement. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether you see uh, a grassroots movement as something that a, a political leader could use. Well, I see something that worries me, which is um, social media and uh, the polarization that we're seeing in many countries and the predominance of emotions over arguments. And the, the social media uh, is, is uh, in a way, tending to emphasize some prejudice that you have. You, you go and you see who, who talks to who, and there's like a vicious circle. You, you talk to people who think like you, or, or want to think like you, and you reinforce your prejudice or your way of seeing certain things, and so the emotions take over. And that makes the dialogue much more difficult. Um, we have to see how we can break that vicious circle, uh, because otherwise the extremes will be fed. And and uh, one, one thing that I learned in the process that we had, and you see it all around the world, it, in, when fear takes over, in, the emotions are multiplied. Fear is probably the most uh, uh, sought uh, uh, condition for the manipulation of a person or of a community. And people, many people are like to feed that fear. Uh, that's why I say that uh, I think that one basic uh, um, move that we have to make around the world is to try to go again to the center in terms of not allowing emotions to take over the arguments. And it's difficult. Manipulating through emotions is, from the political point of view, much easier. 
And, uh, but uh, hopefully, you mentioned grassroots. What we are <coughs> starting to see is some grassroots movements uh, against that manipulation of emotions. And hopefully, they will, be, they, they will succeed because that will, it will make uh, dialogue much easier. So we are really quite out of time, but um, let's just take one question from the audience, if that's OK with the two of you. Does anyone have anything? Yes. <laughs> All right, I'm going to repeat that question for those who might be uh, watching on the webcast. But the question was, how do you make adults, uh, if, if, if children are more, have more tendency towards peace and playfulness, how do you make adults act like that? Yeah. And our questioner notes that his children are always fighting. <laughs> right. So childhood does not mean an age factor. Childhood means transparency, purity, freedom of mind. Childhood means forgiveness. Childhood <coughs> means quest for learning new things always. So that means childhood for me. So if we understand that children possess that, these values and childhood becomes a bigger value or a virtue, so instead of teaching our children, sometimes you spend some time when you go back from here, sit with your son or daughter or your sister or brother. Just watch. Just watch for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It's a practice. And then you will learn that when these two, two children fight, they just forgive and forget. Forget. They don't keep in mind. They don't have any prejudice. So learning from children, de-learning our own barriers and boundaries of mind, and learning simplicity from children. That can come through practice. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Please uh, join me in thanking both of our Nobel laureates.